by the way, we've got over 200 showing up already, so. Very cool. I think that's pretty cool. Sounds good to me. <laughs> Here we go. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning. This is Steve Cantrell with the DBA Fundamentals um, uh, session, first session, actually, I'm sorry, third session of the month of February. And today we have Kimberly Tripp uh, doing stored procedure optimization techniques. And I think everybody's going to love that. Um, first of all, let me talk to you a little bit about a few new things. Um, as you can see here, we've got a uh, He's going to be a silent moderator today. He's going to be handling the questions. He was the originator and the, uh, the, the original guy that started DBA Fundamentals, Mark Swafford. And uh, let me, I'm sorry, my smooth current slide. Our sponsor is Century One. Um, they have plenty of freebies uh, that you can go look at. Obviously, they sell uh, SQL Sentry uh, for uh, for SQL Server, uh, which is an awesome tool. I actually t I haven't used it. I've tested it out, and I really love it, and I really wish we could uh, get it here, but I'm not sure it's going to happen right now. But go and get some of their freebies, uh, and then try their tools out. Uh, SQL Performance, uh, you can go get tons of articles, uh, videos, tons of stuff there, uh, downloads, you can uh, get uh, Plan Explorer uh, for uh, free, uh, the, the professional version, and that would really segue great into uh, the session that Kimberly is going to be giving today. And uh, they'll give you free tuning advice, so try them out. New news. Uh, we've got old and new members. Obviously, I've already introduced Mark. We have a new member, uh, Shane O'Neill, uh, from Great Britain. His Twitter account is at SOZDBA. Uh, today, he's, he's going to be in charge of uh, social media. I made a, um, a request after the last session and said I needed somebody to kind of help me out with some of the other things and to really optimize uh, social media because we were lacking. Uh, in that regard, and uh, pardon the pun, but we have, the first thing he's done is set up a Slack channel for us. There's the invite if you want to uh, sign up and get an invite. I think I sent that out in the last email. Um, there's, and I haven't worked with Slack myself that much, but he's got a channel up and going, and if you want to try it out, he can tell you about it and tell you about different things, but uh, you can go to the at DBA Fundamentals Slack channel. Uh, past last week, we did all of our uh, the entire site as well as uh, the individual chapters. Uh, we're no longer chapters; we're groups now. But uh, check out the new search functions. They have a, uh, the ability to go in and search all of the um, virtual chapters for educational content. They really haven't had that before. It's pretty nice uh, as always with any migration, um, there's things that are still not working perfectly correctly. Uh, let us know if you find anything on our site or any other sites and we'll pass it on. Other chapters, and we don't have the updated slide, uh, there's tons of other groups uh, that cover just about every topic that you can think of and there's tons of other groups that are set in uh, different languages around the world. So there's something for everybody. Give them a try out uh, at sqlpass.org forward slash VC. Here's our meetings that are coming up. Uh, Kimberly's husband, Paul Randall, will be presenting in March performance troubleshooting using weight statistics. This is, besides DBCC, this is probably the one thing that he's super well known for. This this session is going to be fantastic, so you really need to sign up for that one. Uh, down under, we're going to be giving an in-memory OLTP. Um, another SQL skills speaker, Jonathan Cass, uh, deadlocking for mere mortals. Uh, that would be a great one. This session uh, by Glenn Berry um, is 
one of the best sessions we've ever had. Uh, it's one of the most useful, useful sessions. So he'll be giving us an update. This is, I guess, the second repeat we've ever had. Uh, but it's updated, and he keeps up with the, the scripts, the, each version that comes out, and he has new scripts for each. So uh, you need to come check that one out. And, and I should have had this one listed as Down Under, uh, he'll be doing one for uh, our Down Under session on analyzing I.O. subsystem performance. And the next one that we have definitely scheduled is with Brent Ozar, How to Triage SQL Server Emergencies. And I just want to really thank SQL Skills because um, Kimberly and Paul really help out the virtual groups um, a lot by giving tons of sessions and tons of content so you really need to go and check out um, Pluralsight because they have some fantastic education on that. Some other virtual groups uh, this next month women's and the women's in technology virtual group will be having a sweep of four different sessions during the month uh, with Wendy Pastrick to start it off. Um, Aaron Stolato uh, with Extended Events, the second week. Third week will be Kaylin Delaney, and the fourth week will be Ree Irish. You really need to go and check that out. Um, they're a great group, great chapter. They help promote some of our sessions, and uh, we, really, we really appreciate it. And I think you really need to try out some of these um, sessions. They're, like I said, they're going to be going a full month just specifically on um, great topics. Everybody that signs up, I'm going to go back. Sorry. Can turn the slide. Everybody that signs up for a session and attends either in the U.S. or down under, um, or you get one session, um, you get one drawing um, per attendant. Uh, session that you attend and uh, after three months, I guess the end of March, we'll be drawn for a $350 Amazon gift card and we'll start the same thing up after that for three more months. Upcoming SQL Saturdays. Now SQL Saturdays are great, uh, another great free education opportunity um, and if you go to SQLSaturday.com you can see if there's one close by you. These are ones that are, are happening in February, and I haven't checked it uh, in the last couple of weeks. There may be more that's on this list, so go and check it at SQLSaturday.com. It's a full day of uh, free educational content from speakers, uh, and sometimes you have to pay for your lunch, and that's about it. Uh, otherwise, it's just fantastic. Our recordings will be, our session will be recorded, and you can reach uh, this, and it usually is done in about a day, two at the most, uh, at uh, fenomenals.sqlpass.org forward slash meeting dot archive. Uh, or you can go to our YouTube channel and subscribe, and that way as soon as the uh, session hits, uh, you'll get notified if you have your settings that way. Okay. I think that's about it, so let me get this turned over to Kim. Kim is the founder of SQL Skills and the president. Uh, she um, is one, when I first talked to uh, um, Mark Swafford about uh, PASS, um, and he brought me into the DBA Fundamentals group, and we talked about Kimberly and Paul, he said those are two of the best DBAs in the world. and since then, I have found out they're also some of the best teachers in their enti the entire group at SQL Skills. Anyway, um, I'm not going to go into it in great detail, but uh, Kim's going to be discussing stored procedure caching, uh, the potential for performance problems due to parameter sniffing, which I have that that thing can that can drive you crazy. But she's going to give you some good techniques on how to deal with that. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Kim. Great. Thanks, Steve. This is uh, always fun for me. It's one of my favorite topics, as you mentioned, and, and something that I've seen happen in every environment that I have ever consulted on. And I think this is probably one of the most common and probably also most misunderstood problems around 
code and caching and performance. And so I've tried to come up with, and it, it's fairly challenging to do in 60, 75, even 90 minutes, um, but I've tried to come up with what I think are the most salient points around understanding how caching works, understanding how to test to see if you're prone to these caching problems, and then I think I've come up with a, a pretty straightforward solution. It, it changes your programming paradigm, but it is something that if you can get your developers, or if some of you are developers, if you can start to focus on handling your code in a slightly different way, you can significantly reduce a lot of the problems and reduce the actual costs that it takes to cache and store and uh, manage your store procedures. But my goal is to go to about, uh, well, let's say about an hour, hour and 15 minutes, but I am going to stay for questions. I am going to try and watch the questions window. So just as a, a heads up, if you do ask a question here or if you ask a question on Slack, I will try to answer some of those during the webcast. If something is very specific to the webcast, I, I promise I'll try to cover it. If you start going way outside of the webcast, it's going to be a little bit challenging for me to get to that. But I'm going to try to do my best, and I'm going to try to get through my really quick obligatory marketing slides super quick. So I will just kind of roll through here. Um, Steve mentioned our team, and it looks like quite a few of the presentations coming up are done by our team. So you guys will get a chance to experience some of the content and presentation styles of Paul and Glenn and John and Aaron. I saw them all on your schedule in the next month. So there's lots of options. I did see a question that somebody was asking on how to sign up. Um, there's regular tweets, I know. Um, but it would be interesting if there is a centralized location for all of the VCs and, and so forth. But I, I don't think that exists. So Steve, that might be a good suggestion. Um, but you know, a centralized location with all the websites and links. But um, anyway, moving on, we have a lot of content out there. We've got instructor-led training. We've got online training through our partner Pluralsight. We do consulting. We do remote DBA. We speak at conferences. We have an insider program. So there's, there's lots of resources, and I'll let you guys click on the links and check this out when you go through the recording or check out the slides later. We do have some great classes. Probably our most popular are our performance tuning classes. Uh, they're each five days in length. We call them immersion events because most people say it's like drinking from the fire hose. Uh, we spend a lot of time on a lot of technical content. So I'm just going to move through this stuff. We've got an upcoming conference. You can check that out. Um, it's just a, it's more developer and architecture related conference that's in Florida. So if you're having some winter blues and Pluralsight. If you guys want to check out Pluralsight, if you don't know much about it, we do give out uh, free, no catches, no credit card required, 30-day uh, trials, and all you have to do, and I love being able to tell people to send email to Paul, um, but send email to Paul at SQL Skills, put in something like DBA Fundamentals, VC Plural Site Code, or something like that, so he knows kind of where you're coming from, and he'll send you a code. So check that out. There's actually a four-hour course on optimizing stored procedure performance, and then there's an additional three app. Oh wait, sorry. The first course is actually seven hours. <laughs> I've totally even forgotten the length of my courses, but there's 11 hours total on optimizing stored procedure performance, and I'll, I'll give you a little bit of insight throughout the session on what those uh, topics cover because there's kind of a the part two is really something that I think people know very little about, and it has to do with session settings. But anyway, our full course library is online. And my background, um, I'm embarrassed to say, actually, at this point, that I started working with SQL Server in 1990. Um, it was on OS2. It was version 1.0. But I, I, I like to say that I started when I was two. And usually, if Paul's here, he'll say, I wish, because being my husband, he wishes I was two in 1990. Uh, but anyway, I'm just going to move on from here. My main area of expertise tends to be architecture, design, indexing, performance, tuning. So I'm going to just get right into it. This is one of my favorite topics. And like I said, it's something that I see at virtually every customer I go to, every customer that our team works with. It's absolutely one of the most common problem areas. So I'm going to talk about store procedures in general how stored procedures are optimized, and a concept of caching, and what happens with the plans in cache. How long do they stay in cache? What might cause a plan to become invalidated? 
So we'll talk about a lot of interesting aspects around caching, but then I'll really focus on what I consider the plan quality and what happens with a plan that is cached. Is it a good plan? Should it have been cached? Should it not be cached? Maybe some of it should be cached, but some of it shouldn't be cached, right? So this is what we have to focus on is how can we understand the quality of that plan and are there ways to test and figure out if we're having problems with that plan? And really that's going to boil down to when, what, why, and how should we actually recompile part of the plan, all of the plan, and I'll talk about that. And once I show you that problem and once we get into that specific problem area, I've got a solution that I think works really, really well. It's a little bit more challenging than the simple solution, but overall it's generally a better solution than the simple solution. So I will, I promise, show you the simple solution, but if you put a little bit more effort into solving this problem with a little bit more work, it's a little bit more work up front. Long term, it's a, a programming strategy that I think is very easy to reproduce over and over again, but it is a little bit more work up front. So we'll talk about that, and I think you'll get a lot better long term performance because well, because that's what I do, and that's what I end up getting better performance from. So, Steve, did you want to interrupt? I, I heard you unmute for a second. Did you want to add anything? No, no, I'm sorry. Okay. Oh, no, no, that's fine. Um, I just, uh, some people were asking about the Slack channel. Do you want to tell them the Slack channel again? I'm pretty sure, and, and this and this is not uh, my expert, my forte, uh, it's pound sign DBA fundamentals. Okay, perfect. Great, thank you so much. All right, so diving in, story procedures. When you guys create a story procedure, not much happens really at all. <laughs> and I know some people are, are somewhat confused by that, but when you create a store procedure, SQL obviously has to check syntax, and if it finds any errors with syntax, it is going to throw those at you. However, if you reference any temporary objects in that store procedure, really SQL doesn't do much else to resolve those objects. Now in this slide I say that at creation they parse and they resolve or parsing and resolution occur. But resolution only occurs if there are no temporary objects listed. So I like to stress that for a second because sometimes people will go in and make simple changes to their procedures thinking that they're not going to have any problems with them and then it compiles, so they ship it, and then they have problems because they maybe had a typo with some temporary object that wasn't resolved at creation. Because those temporary objects don't have to exist until runtime, so as soon as SQL Server sees those temporary objects, it just says, well, I'm just going to wait till runtime anyway. So it's really important that you always, as part of your kind of change uh, process, check and test. I mean, I know that sounds obvious, but really, no matter what, even as simple as you might think that those changes are, you always want to make the changes, test the changes, and actually go through a variety of tests. And that's one of the things I'm going to focus on even a little bit more in this session. I really have two types of testing strategies that I use for store procedures. So creation's pretty simple. Now here's where things get way more interesting. When you execute a stored procedure, SQL checks to see if there's an appropriate plan for you in the cache. Now, that sounds a little bit strange, and I'm, I'm being very pedantic with the way that I'm saying that as well. Um, the reason why I say an appropriate plan is that you can actually have multiple copies of a stored procedure in your plan cache. And they can even have different plans. A lot of people don't realize this. Have you ever executed in, let's say, Management Studio, and you had a certain behavior, a certain performance, and you thought, yeah, this looks great, but then you went to an application, and the performance was different? Maybe you even had a very different plan if you look at the plan. Part of the reason for that is SQL will only share plans across sessions that have the same session settings. So your application might have different session settings than 
your, let's say, management studio settings. And as a result, you can end up having different plans. So let me come back and bring this all together. When you execute a store procedure, SQL says, is there a plan that's appropriate for these session settings already in the cache? If so, it's going to use that plan. But if not, it's going to put a plan in cache with those session settings. And then that plan will get reused for subsequent users. So this whole execution and putting a plan in cache, if there isn't a plan already in the cache, is actually already more complicated than it sounds. But they do put these in the cache and then use them. And they use them if the session settings are the same. Someone's asking how you see what the session settings are. Um, there's actually a couple of different ways. One of my favorite ways as an administrator is to use the DMV, DM Exec Sessions. I'll leave you guys to play around and run queries for that. If you're a user or an application programmer, you can actually run that and you'll only get your session and your session settings. So there's a couple of ways to do that. There's even some old school ways with things like DVCC, uh, user options, and, and so forth. But the DMV, DM Exec Sessions is really best. So moving on into, oh, and, and that, just as the, the small tangent, that's what I actually spent, <coughs> excuse me, that's what I spent my second optimizing stored procedure course on, on Pluralsight. And, and it was all of the other things that can possibly impact, negatively impact your stored procedures, including session settings. And one of the things that I did in there that I had a lot of fun writing was expanding the DMV uh, so that I could see all of the session settings of my existing plans in cache. So there's a whole bunch of stuff that you can do to really expose that. But just to see your session settings, DM exec sessions is great for that. So processing stored procedures is kind of our intro here. But let's now get into kind of the optimization side and the caching side of things. I've already mentioned that a plan is generated when there isn't already an appropriate plan that exists in the cache. I kind of simplified it on the slide, but it's important to realize there could be multiple plans. And just to be very clear, that second bullet is very important. Plans are not something that are, are stored in the database. Yes, there are things called plan guides. That's a separate concept. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about just the general caching that occurs as you execute statements, as you execute stored procedures. <clears throat> it's still early here. so. My voice is still kicking in for the day, so I apologize for a little bit of scratchiness. Um, but plans are never saved on disk. Now, they can stay in the cache for potentially a long time, but there's a lot of things also that can force a plan to fall out of cache. And some of them are very obvious, like restarting your server. Everything's kicked out of the cache. Or clearing the cache directly with the DBCC free prop cache, which is not something you should do very often, for example, in production, but it's great for testing. <clears throat> DBCC flush proc and DB is something more targeted to just a store proceed or to just a database, and that clears all the plans for a database. But my favorite, if you just want to kick out the plans for a particular store procedure, you could use SP recompile. And to be honest, not all of these things actually kick plans out of cache. Some of them kick plans out of cache, we call that flushing, and some of them only mark the plan as invalid which is effectively the same as kicking it out of the, the cache because it won't get reused. But the nice thing about just invalidating plans in cache is that they're still there for the DBCC, um, not DBCC, I'm sorry, the DMVs to access so that as you're querying some of the DMVs, you can actually see those plans. So there's two things that happen to plans in cache. They can be flushed and then they're gone, or they can be invalidated such that they won't be used again but they're still there for some troubleshooting techniques, which can be very helpful. And some of the cases where you get invalidation rather than flushing of the cached plans are things like schema or statistics changes. And I did put some hidden slides in because I know I only have so much time here. And the next slide is actually one of the slides that is hidden. Um, there's kind of a, a strange history of what happens with regard to plan invalidation. And it's actually tied to database settings. And it's a little bit confusing and convoluted. So I, I left it as a hidden slide, something that you can really focus on. 
But generally speaking, when you guys update statistics, a side effect of updating statistics is that the plan will get invalidated. That's generally a good thing. However, there are some cases where if your database has the database option for updating statistics turned off, the plans will not get invalidated. Now this only happens on earlier versions of SQL Server. As of SQL Server 2012, plan invalidation is no longer tied to the database option. So I'll leave that slide with the, the details for some of you to really drill in on if you're still using 2008 or 2005 and, you know, oh my goodness, let me step on a soapbox for just a second on that. If you're still using 2005 and 2008, now is the time to get off of those versions. A lot of people don't even know, but 2008 is actually already out of regular maintenance. So you are really not working with a, a current version per se. And if I were you, I would not use any other version. I would not look at, I would not consider any other version than 2016. You can back up restore from 2005 even directly to 2016, which is incredibly cool. So I, I, I'll step off my soapbox now. But it's really important for you guys to get those versions up to 2016. And 2008 and 2008 R2 are both out of the standard maintenance. Somebody just asked that question. So I see a couple of questions that are fairly long. It's a little bit hard for me to read the really long ones while I'm presenting. So I'll probably catch up on some of the long ones at the end, just so you guys know. All right. So what's important to realize is that once a plan is in cache, Subsequent executions that match those same session settings are going to use and reuse those plans. So is that a good thing? Maybe, maybe not. I mean, this is really the crux of this entire presentation. When plans get put in cache, the idea is that the subsequent users don't have to pay the cost in compilation which in and of itself can be great, right? You don't have to pay CPU, you don't have to pay for the time that it takes uh, to actually recompile, so you end up saving time by using that plan that's already in the cache for you. And it can actually save cache by not having to put a whole bunch of individual statements in the cache, which is what often happens with a lot of uh, you know, ad hoc statements. Now, all of that sounds good, and, and I actually did that on purpose. I kind of made it sound great that plans go into the cache, get reused, saves time, don't have to compile, you save CPU. Like, all of that sounds absolutely fantastic. However, putting a plan in cache that subsequent users use might not actually be a good thing for those subsequent executions if those users are not executing in a way that's similar to that first user. What do I mean by that, right? Like, what am I thinking when I say that? And the answer has to do with parameters. See, one of the nice things about stored procedures is that you can take some process, simplify it, put a wrapper of a name, a simplified name around it, and then you can call that stored procedure. But then you can say, get members with a different member number, get sales with a different you know, customer number or, or something, maybe product information, like get me all the sales for product ID X, right? And while that sounds great and it is a simplified interface, the problem is how many rows are you going to return for product X versus product Y? This is actually a great thing to, to consider. I've never really done this little tangent here for a moment, but just take this concept for a second. I want to see all of the sales for a product. So my store procedure is going to very simply go to the sales table and look up all the sales for a particular product. Well, if I'm looking up one particular product and there are very few sales for it, to find those sales, it might be a very good idea to use an index. So if that's the first execution, that's the one that's going to be put in cash. Then later, another user says, get products Y a different product number, and that product is our most frequently sold product. And you know what? It might not be good to use the same plan 
for something that returns thousands or tens of thousands or millions of rows as the plan that's in cash that was used for that product that only had a couple of rows. So it's really important to understand that stored procedures, while they simplify access to certain data, certain information, they might complicate things because the plan, the really optimal plan for the specific parameters passed in, might actually need to vary. And unfortunately, with stored procedures, the plan won't vary. The plan is put into cash on that first execution. So I'm really going to show you how to see this, how to test this, how to do a quick and simple solution, especially when you're having terrible problems, and then a longer term solution to this as well. So I will show you all of these things. So, and I do see some good questions, and you're perfectly timed because I can pull in some of these questions with my demo, because I really want to show you what I mean by this with a very common strategy that people use that I often call OSPA procedures, or one-size-fits-all procedures. In fact, I'm also going to tie in something else. There's a, a blog post that I wrote um, corresponding with a past session that I did a while back, but let me just pull this over here for a second. If any of you guys have an application, and I'm even going to zoom in to just this dialog right here. Imagine this dialog in an application, and you're allowing your users to look up a customer. Now, this might only return a row if they put in a customer number, but you're going to also allow them to do like a customer last name, a customer first name, and you have decided that you're going to support any kind of request that those users might possibly come up with. So you're going to allow them to support wild cards. You're going to allow them to do things like, I want all of the customers that have a last name that has an E in it and first names that have an I in it. <laughs> now, personally, I think that's going a little bit overboard. Personally, I'm not a fan of allowing things like leaving wild cards, but you know, sometimes management really wants to allow flexibility in things, and then we think, okay, well, we can do that, so we put in this ability in the application. And then the code looks like this, right? You have all these parameters. I'll see as much as I can get on the screen. We have all these parameters, customer ID, customer last name, and the developer, you know, very cleverly writes one stored procedure that fits all of these different options all in one statement, right? I, I sometimes call this an OSFA procedure, a one-size-fits-all procedure. So the procedure's clause and, and the query basically says where the customer ID is the customer ID parameter right here, right? Or the customer ID parameter is null. And, right, the last name is the last name parameter using a like, or the last name is null. And the first name is like the first name, or the first name is null, right? So they've got all of these different conditions. And just to be clear, this is the same as if you do coalesce. This is the same if you do case. These are all equally terrible, terrible. Okay, terrible, terrible, terrible. I just want to make sure that really sticks in, <laughs> because this kind of code doesn't actually even optimize well. So now, let me get back to the demo. I have a sample environment. I'm going to give you guys the backup to this database, which you can restore to 2008, 2008 R2, 2012, 2014, 2016. You can restore it to any of those versions. If any of you really want to use this on 2005 or 2000, I do have a 2000 backup that you can use as well. So I can prove this problem across every release that is still predominantly out there. Yeah, I know 6.5 is still out there. I, I've actually had people that say, yep, we still have a 6.5 version, lump, you know, limping along. Um, but this problem has been a problem for many releases. It was actually a bigger problem in 2000. In 2005 and higher, the problem is not as bad, but it's still potentially a big problem. So anyway, I am going to be demoing on 2014 but this does still demo and do the same behavior on 2016 as well. So you can do this on any version. I'm going to re-restore my credit database 
This is the only script you guys will have to change because you'll have to put in your path for where you put your backup, the server you're restoring to, and your path for your uh, data files. But that's the only script you'll have to change. Then you'll go over to my setup script. Now my setup script, I'm doing what a lot of developers do when they're generating sample data. And this is also a good time for a simple tangent, which is, how do I want to phrase this politely? Um, sample data often stinks, okay? <laughs> you know, people are pulling data from all sorts of different resources, and what we end up with is, you know, data that's not great. We also end up with not a lot of data, which is also not great for testing and, you know, especially doing performance testing. But the best news I can tell you is that the methods I'm going to show you today are even going to expose problems when the data is bad and when there's actually not that much data. So here's the good news. The environment that a lot of your developers are running in is exactly this. Not very much data, not very good data, and probably pretty decent hardware. I mean, it's kind of unbelievable the processing power that most of us have on our desktops or even our laptops these days. I mean, I can get away with an amazing amount of really crummy code, and my server, my laptop, just keeps on chugging away at it, and we barely notice it. So the way I'm going to do this is, first of all, credit does have some data in it, but I'm also going to, well, let's say I need more data. So I've got this other database on my machine called AdventureWorks 2012, and I'm going to run a query to insert some of that data from AdventureWorks into my um, member table, right? So I'm going to end up saying insert, right? And that, so here's my member table. And then I'm going to add an email column because that's something that I'm going to query on. I'm going to give people a middle initial, add a couple of interesting rows that I might later query on, like Paul and, Paul and I here. And I'm going to add an email, which is kind of a dumb email because I'm just taking a first name, dot middle initial, dot last name with a kind of generic subdivision company name, basically. And at the end, so I'll, I'll run those and everything's running very quickly because I only have like 30,000 rows. So not that much data. So this script is pretty easy. The only thing you guys might not have is an AdventureWorks 2012. So you don't have to do that. You can skip that statement, but you want to do everything else. And then finally, we get to script two, multipurpose procedure.sql. Now I am using, as you can see on the screen, I am using a um, solution file called multipurpose procs. That SSMS SLN file, if you can't open it because you're not on the right version of Management Studio, well, the first thing I would say is, well, you should be running Management Studio from 2016 because then you won't have any problems. But if you do have any issues, you can just open up the files directly by going into the subdirectory. Um, I guess I can show you this. When I pass on the resources, I will pass on, where is it? There it is, this multi-purpose prox SSMS SLN, and then there'll be a subdirectory sub called multi-purpose proc part one, and it has the files in it itself. So you guys will be completely able to reproduce this stuff. All right, so now, when I see a lot of queries like the one I just showed you, right, where there's a whole bunch of this and this and this and this in a query, or, or just any query, as we start to run those queries, I often see tuning where people say, well, first name's in the where clause, maybe we need an index on it. Last name's in the where clause, maybe we need an index on it. Emails in the where clause, maybe we need an, e an index on it. And, and for some queries, these indexes will be very useful. So we start going through this, you know, where clause index, where clause index strategy. Now, just like the important note says at line 72, 73, and 74, I'm not really saying this is a good idea, but this is what we often end up with. We often end up with a whole bunch of narrow indexes. So I'll create those indexes, and I'll just show you quickly what my indexes look like on the table, right? So I end up seeing all of these narrow indexes 
on member code, email, first name, last name. Okay, so for some queries, yes, these indexes are good. For some queries, these indexes maybe aren't so good. Okay, but having said that, here's our very clever OSFA procedure. So I want to go ahead and if it exists, drop it. And then I'm going to go ahead and recreate this get member information procedure with all these parameters and the where clause exactly like I just showed you in the blog post. I mean, exactly. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and drop and recreate that. Okay, so I've just dropped and recreate that. And now I'm going to run a couple of simple executions. And I'm going to run things like get member information, last name, trip, get member information, email address, you know, percent 27.com, so that's a leading wild card. Get member information, member number 9912. And I'm a developer of this. I run these three things. And as many of you will notice, as soon as I run these things, they pretty much come back instantly. In fact, they don't even register a half a second across all three of these running. So all of these were sub-second. And as a developer, if I run this and I see all of this performance, you know, just really fast, no problem, coming back instantly, I kind of ask myself some questions, especially if I tested more scenarios than just these. I mean, as a good developer, you really want to do very thorough code coverage testing. You know, you want to test a bunch of combinations, you want to test all of your branches, and, and thoroughly testing this code is referred to as code coverage. So it's very important to do that. So you would do more tests than this. But imagine you ran 10 or 15 or 20 different tests and they all came back sub-second. You know, I would ask myself these questions. Does it work? Well, yes, I'm getting the right data. Does it run quickly? Does it run fast? Well, yeah, I mean, I ran multiple executions and they all ran, you know, sub-second. So a lot of people at this point would go, okay, chip it. You know, we're ready to rock and roll with this procedure. And here's the problem. All we've done is made sure that we got back the data. And unfortunately, we didn't have a lot of data. We didn't have good realistic data in our environment. And as a result, I don't even know if what we're getting is even a good plan. Just because my machine ran very quickly doesn't actually mean that I want this in production. So I have a whole another type of testing that I call planned stability testing. Now, this might seem much more advanced and like you're going to have to know a tremendous amount about stored procedure plans and so forth. And, and here's the good news. You actually don't. Okay? But there are going to be some key things that show up by doing a second set of tests. So I'm going to turn just to start statistics I.O. and statistics time on, and I'm going to turn on the graphical execution plan. Okay, so that's using this icon, right? So I'm up in the toolbar and I'm just checking to see if you guys can see that. And I'm going to run statistics I.O. and statistics time, and I'm going to go back and I'm going to do those three executions again. So get member info, last name of trip, email address, and member number. And I'm going to go ahead and execute those, get my data back. It comes back, you know, pretty instantaneously. And without even looking at the plan, because like I told you, you don't have to know the plans yet. I'm going to go over to the messages window and just look at the IOs and the time. Because if this all came back really quickly, then I should see very low times and very low IOs, or at least I would be expecting that. And in the first query, I see IOs of 78 and a time of 64 milliseconds. And the next query, I see IOs of 90,000. Now, on my machine, which is pretty beefy, I don't even have any spinning drives. I have something like 3.25 terabytes of, of solid state drives in this machine. I've got 32 gig of memory. It's my laptop. I mean, I'm amazed at what we can get today in our hardware. Now, don't get me wrong. It's also nine pounds, OK? So you know, there's a pro and a con to everything. <laughs> <laughs> so it's powerful, yes, but it's also hiding, and this is happening on a lot of your developer machines, it's hiding things like this. I didn't notice this huge discrepancy in IOs because it was hidden by my hardware. 
it was hidden by the fact that my machine can process these I.O. very quickly. And, and I would even argue that in today's hardware, 90,000 I.O.s isn't that much. But what I'm trying to stress is that it seems like something very drastic and very different is happening to these procedures. So then out of curiosity, let's say I go and look at the execution plan. And here's one of the ways that you guys are going to be misled. You go to the execution plan and you see 33, 33, 33, and you think, yeah, it was exactly the same across all of these. Well, yes, the plan is exactly the same across all of these. And even though I'm showing you the actual execution plan, what you really see is the plan that was used, which is the plan that got determined by the very first execution. And all of the numbers on this screen are tied to what it cost when it was first executed. These are not the costs right now that I'm executing it. These are really across that first execution. And so everything looks the same. Now, if you go to that second plan and you start to hover over it, one of the things that you might see is an estimate that's off from actual. So let me zoom into that and focus on that for a second. I see an estimate of 1.98 rows and an actual of 30,000 rows. Immediately, a lot of folks would say to me, oh my gosh, look at that, the statistics are wrong. They would say, SQL Server is so stupid, it's getting the stats completely wrong. And unfortunately, stats get blamed often when they are not to blame. And this is actually the more common problem than statistics. Don't get me wrong, statistics are not perfect. I would be the first person to say that. I do a, a tremendous amount of work around statistics, understanding statistics, tuning statistics, fine-tuning stats. I love statistics, as weird as that sounds. But this is not a statistics problem. And unfortunately, statistics get blamed. So you know what happens. Somebody sees this and they say, oh my gosh, these darn statistics. Well, they might say something else, but I'm on a webcast and I'm being recorded. So I'm going to say, oh my gosh. So, oh my gosh, the statistics look off. So then they go over and they update statistics. Well, remember I told you a few slides ago that when you update statistics, SQL Server will very likely, most of the time, there's one exception to this, but most of the time, very likely, they will invalidate the plan. So you update stats, it invalidates the plan, you run the stored procedure again, and you get a better plan, so then you get a false positive. You get a false positive that proves to you that updating statistics solved your problem. But it wasn't the updating of stats. It was the plan change. And you could have gotten away with just invalidating that plan and not do all that work of updating stats. So I really want to stress, one of the first things that you guys should be doing is not blindly updating stats all the time. In fact, one of the coolest simple things I can show you is a very easy way to test if the plan in cache is maybe not as good as it could be for you. Lines 174 and 177. I'm going to take the exact same execution that I had up at line 163, and I'm going to run it again with recompile. Now, execute with recompile is actually not one of my favorite ways to recompile. It's actually not as good as other ways. But in this case, it can be very useful. So I'm going to run these. Now, what's really interesting is line 174 is going to get the current plan that's in cache. Line 177 with recompile is actually going to get a plan just for line 177. That plan won't touch the plan that's already in cache. It will put its plan in cache. It won't invalidate the plan in cache. It will have a plan just for itself. And I really want to stress this. It does not impact the plan that's in cache. So when I run these two, the first thing you'll probably notice is that I'm getting back different data. Well, no, I'm not. I'm just getting data back in different orders. And that just tells me kind of immediately, I bet I had a different plan. right? If your query does not have order by, 
the way you get your data back may not be consistent. So that's important to realize, right? You can't trust the way your data is being returned unless you ask for things like order by. So if I had had an order by, it wouldn't, been, wouldn't have been as obvious. But if I go over to the execution plan window, it's immediately more interesting. Like, you don't even have to know how to read the plan. You know, you can bring your five-year-old in and say, do these patterns look the same, right? And, and the answer is no, right? There's a different pattern to the plan in the first execution than there is in the second execution. Now, also misleading is the 17 and the 83, the query cost relative to the batch. It says that the first plan is only 17% of the cost of that batch, whereas the second one is 83. So some people would say to me, well, I really want that first plan because it's cheaper. Well, unfortunately, that 17% comes from that initial estimation and the cost of that plan if it's running with only 1.96 rows. Unfortunately, in this case, it's not running with the 1.96 rows. So unfortunately, everything you see in terms of these numbers, in terms of these percentages, is wrong. Because they are tied back to the initial execution and the estimation. Again, where you're getting better information is looking at the IOs and the time. The shape of the plan is important. Knowing that the plan is different is important, right? But what you have to understand here is that you are getting a different plan, which means that the optimal plan for different parameters might vary. So let's go back. And I, there's a couple of long questions, so I'm going to get to those at the end. Now let me run this next one. Again, give me the plan in cash for line 180 and give me a new plan for line 183. Same parameter with recompile. And I execute those, and again, looking at the plan shape, hey, it looks the same. Ah, but let's drill in a little bit more. The first one does an index scan on member last name, right? And if I zoom in, you can actually see that right here. I'll give a second for the screen to catch up. But you can actually see the member last name object being used in that first execution, and it's doing an index scan. I haven't even criticized that yet. Okay? But the next one, this one's weird. The second plan, looking for member 9912, which is, by the way, the clustering key. Okay? It's doing an index scan as well of a different index. Of a smaller index, yes, but of a different index. But it's doing a scan. Okay, let me go back here for a second. You might not have noticed this because I wasn't really dwelling on the plans. But when you have like inside of these OSFA procedures, you will actually never, ever even get the most optimal plan that's possible for certain parameters. You just won't even get that. And I'm, I'm going to show you more on this. I, I'm not done yet. I, I, I'm going to clarify some of the questions you guys are asking about parameter sensitivity and parameter sniffing. Okay? And you should be testing for parameter sensitivity and parameter sniffing, what I'm showing you here, long before production. I really want to stress this. It doesn't have nearly as much to do with data skew as it has to do with the possibility of different data sets because of the parameters passed. Parameter sensitivity is very much so tied to the number of parameters and the results set the, that the stored procedure gives. So I really say that if the results from a stored procedure wildly vary, then that stored procedure is going to be more likely and more sensitive to the parameters passed in. And this is something that development can see very early on. They just don't know to look for it. And most of us don't see it until we're in production. And unfortunately, fixing it there becomes a more complicated problem. But I do have solutions, OK? I promise I'm going to bring all of this together and make it really clear. So let's make sure that we're, we're clear at this point. The plan that's in cache doesn't seem to be as good as the plan that I get when I recompile because, and at this point, it's solely in the IOs. Here, it's not a big drop, right? Here, 
we could drop from 78 to 50 because we're still doing a kind of inefficient plan with the scan. But if I go back to this email address one and just look at the IOs, we see 90,000 versus 926. So we end up seeing quite a drastic difference in the execution times. And I know as I switch between screens, it takes a little bit more time to catch up. So I'm watching to make sure that it's catching up and so you can see this. So again, you don't have to care about the plans. You only have to care about the plan shape. And you have to see that there's drastically different results. And, and sometimes a difference in time as well. It's just here on such a small data set, it's not that drastic. But I will show you how you can really prove this. So let me go back to the slides for a second. I promise I'm going to bring all of this together. There is that slide. There it is. OK, so my little joking hashtags here. Multipurpose procedures, they look good in development, but they don't end up scaling well in production. And like I said, I'm kind of showing you ways that you can see this. So the key points at this point are just because something runs well in development doesn't mean that those fast times are going to occur in production. Because in production, you're going to have more data, more users, more of an impact on cash. You're going to have different I.O. patterns, different hardware. I mean, there's a tremendous number of variation between development and production. And probably the most important one that really is problematic, and I, and I really do want to stress this, is that the data size and data quality, it does matter. I mean, if you can take a production you know, volume of data and take that data and bring it into a development environment and do your testing against that, I promise you, you'll have a lot better testing and test quality and performance metrics and analysis. Yes, I get that. But not everybody can do that. There's a, a variety of reasons. It might be a security problem. It might be a, a size and volume problem. You might not even just have enough you know, disk space and server capability of running your production environment in your test environment. I mean, I, I would say try to be able to do that. But then we go back to security. And you might have to obfuscate the data. So there, there's a tremendous number of tangential problems that start to come to play when somebody says, we want to test against that data in development. So I get that. But what I'm showing you today, you can still do even if you don't have the same volume and the same data quality, because you can still quickly recognize problems. And what I'm going to show you next is really going to prove my point. So first and foremost, when you have parameters, especially when you start to have three, four, five, six, ten, or, or even more parameters, if there's a wild variation in the amount of data that's returned or the type or use of those parameters, I can almost instantly tell you, you're probably going to have problems with that stored procedure. So instead of getting all the way into production where you might have tremendous problems, there are things you can do earlier on. And that's what I'm kind of getting at. And I'm going to show you a very cool way to see this. Um, and, and just to be very clear, some problems, some of you might not have seen because you haven't hit a really terrible problem, but I have seen single stored procedures, just a single stored procedure, pretty much take down servers. I mean, I, I had one uh, customer that became my customer because of this particular problem that basically when a bad plan for one particular stored procedure got into the cache, they couldn't even connect to their server to troubleshoot. Now, they didn't know about the DAC. Um, they, they were kind of accidental or reluctant DBAs, as we sometimes call them. You know, they, they were standing close to the server the day that the database DBA was hired. So they went, you! <laughs> you know, we kind of jokingly call that the accidental DBA. And as an accidental DBA, obviously, you don't know everything. In fact, I, I've been working with SQL Server for, I can't even believe, 27 years. And there is not a day, uh, this might sound crazy for some of you guys, but there is not a day that goes by where I don't learn something new, where I don't go, wow, I didn't know that. And then I start digging in deeper, and I might find out that's been that way for three versions. you know. And, and, and so don't beat yourself up for not knowing something. You know, we all started with no, you know, zero knowledge on SQL Server. You know, we're not dumb. I'm not saying you're dumb. Please do not misunderstand me. This stuff is not intuitive. There are so many things in SQL Server that I get so frustrated with equally like you guys do, okay? 
please don't get me wrong. So it's not that we're dumb. It's not that we're doing stupid things. It's that we don't know to test for these things. We, we haven't been taught to look for these things. That's what I'm doing today. I'm trying to show you that in addition to code coverage, there is another thing that you can do that's not super hard to do. It's just nobody knows they need to do it. And I call it plan stability testing. So let me dive in. This is going to be the result of plan stability testing, this crazy screen that shows you a whole bunch of different execution numbers. And it's taking a second to uh, populate to all of you guys, but there it is. Now this screen, when you first look at it, I, I know many of you guys are going, I have no idea what the heck that means. Okay, so let me show you what that means. I'm going to go back into my demos. And I have a script called multi-purpose procedure executions with different parameters. So it's just one of the five scripts there, so it's not hard for you guys to find. And I'll show you that basically what it does is it uses credit, and then there's a hidden line, line 24 is commented out, and then it grabs the date and time at the, the start of the execution. It turns statistics I/O and time on. I do another use credit because sometimes I play around with this in different ways. That's kind of redundant though. And then I have kind of like query one, which probably would have been better labeled as like scenario one. It doesn't really matter, it's just a label anyway. But the first execution, I'm doing something that maybe is really common. Get member info with a member number. Query two, get member info, last name of trip, first name of Kimberly. Query three, and I'll just scroll and show you that I have a bunch of different executions in here. In fact, there's something like 14 different scenarios. And the idea is this. I'm going to go back to the top. I'm going to use credit. Make sure I'm in the credit database. And I'm going to take that hidden line at line 24. I'm going to take that SP recompile. And remember, I told you, if you do an SP recompile of a procedure, the plan gets invalidated. So now, I have kicked that plan out of the cache. So I'm going to go back to the script, okay? and I'm going to pick one. That's going to be what puts the plan in cache, what determines the plan that should go into the cache. So I'm going to take, let's say, scenario four or query four, and I'm going to run query four. So I'm going to execute that. There's nobody else on my machine, so that's going to be the plan that is put in the cache for this procedure. Then I'm going to go back, make sure that nothing is highlighted, and I'm going to run the whole script. So do you see what's happening here? My script is full of all my, let's say, code coverage tests. This is a script your developers probably already have for testing. Okay? So they <clears throat> will have all of their tests in one place. Now when you did the SP recompile, you invalidated all of the plans. Somebody asked for that. They, they asked which plan is being invalidated. All of them. When you do SP recompile of a procedure, all of the plans for that procedure are invalidated. So right now, there's no plan in the cache. Now, I am going to do a quick tangent because you guys have asked for this. How do I know what my session settings are? I'm going to bring up a new window. And I'll show you that DMV that I love, which, of course, typing in a window is always the worst thing I can do because I'm a terrible typo when people are watching. <laughs> but I'm going to do my select star from sys DM exec sessions. And if you're interested, one of the things I like to tack on for an administrator is where is user process equals one. So now I can see the session settings of all connected user sessions. So if I run that, I can see there's a whole bunch of connected windows, and, and those are all basically me, or they're my agent, and so forth. Now, scrolling about halfway in, and I'm scrolling kind of quickly because I just want to get to the half. About halfway into the results, column-wise, is the column is user process. So I scrolled pretty quickly, but that should be populating on most of your screens now. And right there is where they start to show you the session settings as they are set for each of the currently connected sessions. And just showing you two columns of interest, check that out. Quoted identifier and a RIP abort. 
don't have the same values all the way down. In fact, for some session settings, quoted identifier is one, for some it's zero, for some a RIFA board is one, for some a RIFA board is zero. And what you will find is that .NET clients have different session settings than, for example, Management Studio clients. So it's really interesting and very important to realize that when you have different session settings, you will end up having different plans as well. But I, I only have so much time, so I'm not going to dwell on the plan side of things. If you really want to get much more involved with this whole session setting stuff, check out the Optimizing Procedural Code course Part 2 on Pluralsight, because I spend a bunch of time on really deeply analyzing this and showing you how to see this even at the plan level. So that's pretty cool. But I, I at least wanted to touch on that question. Now back to my script, since I just did an SP recompile, I have invalidated all of the plans. Okay, all of the plans. So, and, and just to answer this question really quickly, this session is being recorded and we will be posting, uh, Steve's going to do this later, we will be posting that tonight or tomorrow at the latest and I will also be doing a blog post with a link so you guys might want to check that out. And do you want to add more? No, that's it. Okay, okay perfect. Thank you. Um, okay, so back to where I'm at here. I just recompiled so let me run the whole, well, wait a minute, I recompiled, I did run, yes, and I did run scenario four. So when I recompiled, it invalidated. When I ran scenario four, it put a plan in cache for scenario four. So now if I run this whole script, if I run all my code coverage tests, and I go, even if I look at the plan, if I turned on show plan, which I didn't do, you would see the same plan across all of them. I'm just going to show you the, the IOs. Because this, in and of itself, already tells a very interesting story. So the first one did 114 IOs, and it seems like there's some other stuff going on, like a work file, a work table. Again, I don't want to get wrapped up in all the nitty-gritty, because you don't need to know everything to already know there's a problem. Okay? But this has to do with the type of join that's being done. It's doing something called a hash join, and a hash join requires a certain amount of memory uh, for what's called the build table, and what's really interesting is on that first execution, they have decided how much memory should be granted to that process tied to how much data that scenario four was going to access. So one of the biggest problems that we end up having is that some of these other executions have more data, and they're going to spill. So that's a further problem. So again, I'm kind of geeking out there. You can't see any of that here. You can actually see that in the plans, though. But just look at the IOs. Go back to the IOs. I promise you can see these problems very clearly, very simply by just looking at, like, IOs and time. So 114, mils, uh, 114 IOs, 7 milliseconds. 91,000 IOs, 150 milliseconds. Again, you know, on such a fast machine, the milliseconds aren't really telling a great story, but the IOs are. You know, I'm seeing drastically different numbers. That next one did 91,000, but this one did 486, and the next one did 414. So here's what I did. I took a bunch of these executions, and I started tracking just the IOs. So I'm, I'm going to show you the slide for a second, and then I'll go back to the demo. So looking at the slide, if I put the plan for scenario one in the cache, it actually turns out to be the same plan for scenarios one, five, and ten. So across all of those, I get the same IOs. And then for scenario one, I get 50. For scenario two, I get 90,000. For scenario three, I get 90,000. If I clear the cache with SP recompile and I run scenario two, then my numbers are the column for scenario two. And the same goes for each one of these scenarios. Scenario 4 is the one I demoed because Scenario 4 is one of the most interesting because Scenario 4 does do more optimal IOs for Scenario 4, but because of the join that's chosen and because of the grant that's chosen, it actually becomes really bad across a lot of the other scenarios. And again, even if you just look at IOs, you're already seeing it. The other place that you would see it, so I'll switch back, I'll turn on the show plan, and I'll rerun this entire execution again, and I'll show you the show plan. So I've got to wait for the show plan to catch back up for you guys. So I've just run it again. 
I've asked for show plan, and now I can see 7%, 7%, 7%, 7, 7%, because I ran like 14 executions, 100 divided by 14 is 7. So it's not the relative batch cost that's telling me. In fact, there's very little that's telling me anything here, because the plan shape, index scan, index scan, lookup, index scan, index scan, lookup, index scan, index scan, the plan is exactly the same. The only tiny thing that jumps out at you in these different executions is on the hash match, there's a warning sign. And if I go over to that and I look at that warning sign, I can see, it's at the bottom of the screen, again I'll let you guys catch up here, that it shows a warning that the operator used tempdb and actually spilled because of the memory grant. Now, again, you can spend years learning SQL Server and not know everything. And, and I, that's not what I'm trying to dwell on here. Again, I'm just showing you that it's obvious very early, very quickly, that this stored procedure has issues, right? That's where we're at. This stored procedure has issues across these executions. And the issues vary across whichever plan happens to get into the cache. So whoever gets there first is going to define you know, how bad the problem is for subsequent executions under each of the different combinations and scenarios, which sounds terrible, right? I mean, I sometimes you know, jokingly say, because people at this point are, are nervous and, and almost panicking, like, how do I deal with this? Like, is there no hope? What, what can I do? And, you know, some people say, well, I'll just execute with recompile to get a new plan for every ex No, 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 no. Don't do that. Some people say, well, I'm going to do SP recompile to kick the plan out of cache when I see the problem. No, don't do that either because that's too much work and that's too tedious, right? And you're, you're going to have to be putting out every fire as it occurs. Obviously, that is not ideal. Updating stats, I've already told you guys is a knee-jerk reaction, and unfortunately, you know, it's really not the right solution either. This is terrible because you're wasting all this time to read the data, build the, the, the work tables for updating stats, which go into 10 dB, update the statistics themselves, when in fact the stats might not even be changing. So you don't want to pay the price. Now, some of you may have heard about option recompile, and option recompile is very useful and in fact can be a fantastic option here. There are other options and I will talk just briefly to those. Somebody's asking about option, uh, option optimized for unknown, um, but I, I will touch on those at the end here. Now, I know a lot of people have at least heard about option recompile. I've heard, I, I know a lot of people have heard about option recompile and that, oh, you gotta be kidding me. I thought I turned this darn thing off. Sorry guys. Trying to turn off the sound, and I went the wrong direction. Okay, nice. That's nice. okay. I, I worry about mine all the time. <laughs> I totally forgot to turn that off. Sorry, guys. Okay, so let me talk about this whole plan quality problem. And and I'm about five minutes from being done, so I'll still have ten minutes for questions and so forth. But in terms of plan quality, if you're having prob problems with the plan quality, yes, one of the the ways to deal with it is to do some level of recompilation so that you get a more optimal plan. But the things that I want to stress is how you do this, when you do this, what granularity that you use this, you know, and, and are there different options? Do I actually need to recompile or can I possibly use some other method of dealing with the problem? Different options like option optimized for unknown. And how can I test this? So yes, in this case, I probably want to consider something like recompilation. But like I said, there's different ways that I can look at it. Now, I'm going to show you how to do this, and I don't want you to freak out thinking I have 25,000 score procedures across 70 servers. I'm going to be spending the next four years doing this. No, that's not my point. Some of you guys will be able to use this very strategically, very sparingly, across the most core critical procedures that are the highest priority most expensive, most problematic procedures. 
And many of you already know what those are because those stored procedures are like swear words in your office, right? I mean, you know the stored procedures that drive you bonkers, the stored procedures that you've updated stats to fix, the stored procedures that you've cleared cache to fix, and, and the stored procedures that seem to work okay some of the times, but then sometimes they're horrible, and oh my god, those statistics are bad, right? Like, that's maybe what you've arrived at. Now, if you don't know which stored procedures are the most expensive, there's another DMV that can help you, and that's the DM Exec Procedure Stats DMV. This is incredibly useful for telling you which procedures are the most expensive, and one of the things that I like about it is it tells you the, you know, the min, max, and average execution times. So if the min, max, and average are wildly varying, that might be more of a contender for this kind of tuning because it sounds like it wildly varies, okay? But here's where we're at. I'm going to go over and I'm going to show you the simple solution here. I'll bring up my demo. Here we go. So it'll take a second to populate for you guys. But I'm now in script three, multi-purpose procedure solution one, and this solution is incredibly simple, right? I'll use credit, I'll turn IOs on, and then I'll scroll to the solution. All I'm going to do here is what you see in line 58. I'm going to tack option recompile on. Now, this will solve your problem, and it will turn out that in some cases, the cost of recompilation can be far cheaper than the cost of executing a bad plan. Okay? So this is going to look great. Right? I'm going to turn on option optimize, um, or sorry, option recompile. I'm going to try a couple of executions, and I'm going to see that they come back quickly, but they've always done that, right? So I'm going to go over and look at the IOs, and I'm seeing numbers I've never seen before. I'm seeing five, I'm seeing 900. That still seems high, but if you remember, that one was 90,000 a few minutes ago. And then I'm seeing three. So I'm seeing great numbers. So let's go over to our code coverage test script, go back up to the top, and run it across every execution. And again, it only takes a second to run the whole thing. And I start looking at the messages window. And I start looking at this. I see 3, 5, 6, 391, 3, 6. I don't need to rattle all of these off. The point, if I go back to that set of executions, just like we did for all of those different executions on that prior slide, look at the numbers now. I mean, there is no number that is anywhere close to the other numbers. They're all drastically lower. So I know some people are just going to hang up on the webcast right now because this looks amazing. It seems super easy. People want to run out of the room right now and go fix their code, but please don't do that. Not yet. Give me... You know, two or three more minutes. I've just got one more thing I want to show you. Because there is a bad side to option recompiling. Unfortunately, as people use this and see with some procedures that they get much better performance, they start to abuse it. And they start to use it everywhere. And unfortunately, there's a lot of scenarios that don't really need to be recompiled. In fact, I'm going to do this a little differently. Imagine, I'm bringing up a, a query window, and I'll give it a second to catch up. Imagine I just had three parameters to this stored procedure, because seven is a little bit more complicated. But imagine I just had three parameters, member number, last name, and first name. So they could supply just member number, just last name, just first name. They could supply member number and last name. They could do member number and first name. They could do last name and first name. They could do member number, last name, and first name. And that's it, right? This is why I did only three, <laughs> right? So there are seven possible combinations that could be used when this stored procedure is executed. So let me ask you this question. If I say, you know, show me all the users that have an E in their last name and have an I in their first name and have a member number of one, two, three, who cares about last name and first name for that query, right? The point I'm trying to make is that as soon as member number is supplied, that plan is a stable, simple, consistent plan. So in four of these seven executions, I really shouldn't recompile, 
right? Because if it's stable, I uh, do not want to recompile. <clears throat> because as soon as member number is supplied, SQL Server can say, I'm just going to do a lookup against member number, and then I'll check the other things. Now, the other conditions might need to be recompiled in some cases, but, you know, you might actually say for last name, if they use an equality case, or I should say this a little bit differently, if they don't use any wild cards, then you can argue that that might not need to recompile. Maybe that should use an index. So here's my point. There is another strategy that you can use. It's a little bit more work up front. It's a programmatic change, right, that can end up being a much better way of handling this than any of the option clauses. And this is, some of you keep asking about option optimized for unknown. There are some use cases for that. I have a better solution. That's what I'm trying to stress. At the very end, I'm happy to talk about what that does, okay? But this solution that I'm about to show you is even better than that because you can see in some of these cases, I don't want to actually recompile it all. And I could even take this further. Like imagine that some executions are maybe very common. Like what if this stored procedure does allow these seven possible options, but let's say, you know, 60% of the time they're doing a member number lookup. Then I would argue, you know, if I'm already weighting this so heavily for something that shouldn't be recompiled, then I really don't want to be recompiling all the time. So, let me get to my solution here. This is number four. So this one, like I said, is more work up front because you're going to have to change the way that you code your stored procedure. And what I'm doing here is I have my parameters. Maybe I'm going to throw in some error handling. And then let's start looking at line 88. Okay, so I'm going to declare a variable and set a flag for recompilation that by default will recompile. Then I start building the generic string and only adding to the string the values that are not null. So if member number is not null, I'm going to tack on and member number equals the member number I'm passing in. If last name is not null, I'm going to tack on and last name is like the last name I'm passing in. And that stuff is pretty straightforward. And now you'll have to take a few minutes to look at that. But then the coolest part is really what I'm doing between lines 120 and line 140, 134. I'm basically saying if the member number is not null, turn off the recompile flag. I'm saying if I'm supplying at least three characters before the wild card of last name and three characters of the first name before the wild card, then don't recompile. So I have, and this is something that you can tweak over time as you start to even learn your data better, but there'll be certain criteria that you might be able to set right away so that it won't recompile. And now you basically say, if we are still supposed to recompile, line 134, then add to your string option recompile. Now this is doing two things. For every possible combination, you will get a slightly different string. So now, we're not going to have just one plan in cache, but we'll have one plan in cache for every combination. So in and of itself, it's already better, but we're going to take it further for any combination that we don't trust to have a stable plan. Those and only those will get recompiled. This is so cool. I love this. And, and for some of you, this will totally change your stored procedure coding world. <laughs> it is so cool. Now, this next line here, line 138, I'm just doing that to show you the results of the statement that I'm generating. You wouldn't want that in production. And then the way I'm going to execute, and this is something some of you might not know, I am not using dynamically executed strings. I am dynamically constructing a string, but I'm using the SP execute SQL method which is actually a forced caching method, meaning 
when you execute a statement with SPExecute SQL, you are forcing that statement into cache and subsequent users will use that plan from the cache. Unless you've said to recompile. So this is really cool. You have taken the stored procedure, taken this statement out of the stored procedures cache, brought it down to the statement cache, and then for an even further subset from there, you're recompiling the ones that aren't stable. Again, it takes a little bit more work up front, but once you adopt this method, you will significantly reduce the amount of compilations and get a lot better performance. Now, you don't have to use just option recompile. There are some other options that can be beneficial, but you have to know your data better. And while they might work some of the time, they don't work all of the time. And again, I'll come back to those. So this combination is one of my favorite. Um, now that I've made my code like this, I can go back to this multi-purpose procedure executions and run the whole thing. Did I actually run that one? No, I just ran this three. There it is. It's this one. Sorry. So I'll run this script again where I have all the different executions. And I'll see again that the whole thing runs fairly quickly. But now I'm also producing what the statement looks like. So let me show you that right there, the highlighted one towards the top of the screen. Select m.star from member where the 1 equals 1 is just a dummy clause for the where clause, and member number equals member number. Now, obviously, that one should be cached. So because I'm pushing it into the cache with SP execute SQL, it is cached. It won't get recompiled. So that will now save me time for that combination. This next one, I supplied an actual last name and an actual first name, so that's going in the cache. But if somebody put in a wild card, then for their execution, they would get recompiled. Right? This is very, very cool. So, and for some of you asking about pat index, I'm going to have to push you to the books online on that. It's basically a way of testing a pattern in your string, but uh, there's just only so much time. So this is so cool, though. I really want to stress that. And, and that will take a little bit of time for you to get familiar with some of the really cool things you can do to test your parameters, check your parameters, right? But this solution, right, is so much more powerful and really allows you a lot better flexibility and recompilation. So you can get huge benefits by just using optional recompile. Don't get me wrong. And there are other options. And, and give me one more second, I promise. Um, option optimize for un... Uh, I'll just do that here. Some people have asked, why am I using option recompile? Well, when a procedure wildly varies and there's a tremendous number of parameters and each of those parameters have different plans, then option recompile is probably one of the better choices to get the best plan. But of course, it has the negative I just described, which is that it costs a lot in terms of recompilation. Another option to use instead of option recompile is something called option optimized for unknown. And what that does is it says don't look at the incoming parameters. Instead, get the averages across the different data values and give me a plan that is kind of for the average type of data. Now, if your data is relatively evenly distributed, that can end up working very well. But the more skewed your data is, the less likely that is going to work. So you can try that, but you're really going to have to do a wide variety of testing and understand your data distributions to know that that's working. So it certainly is an option, and it's certainly a lot more cost effective in terms of recompilation, but I can't tell you that it's going to get a great plan and give you great performance across all of the executions. That's something that you're going to have to be able to test, and, and you're going to have to know that through a wide variety of testing. I like the combination I showed you because I am forcing good plans, good stable plans into cache, and I'm forcing SQL to recompile those that aren't stable. So I kind of love this, for, especially for multi-purpose procedures where you're trying to, to use this one procedure to satisfy a whole bunch of different combinations. So that's the end for today. I have a tremendous number of resources out there. In fact, 
One of the blog posts that I'm going to do this afternoon, SQL skills, we're starting a SQL 101 series. So we're going to try to do some shorter, back to the basics, you know, problems that we see in customers and just really making sure to clarify some of the key points. And I'm going to start off and kick off the series today with one on store procedures. Um, and then we're going to aggregate all the posts from the entire team into a little help uh, on SQL skills. I've got a past TV presentation as well, so some of you may want to watch this, some of you may want to also watch that. Um, I've got a blog post that I, I did show you guys briefly that you guys want, might want to read. Um, I've got the courses on Plural site that I mentioned. I would actually recommend, if you have the time and really want to be thorough about this, start with optimizing ad hoc statement performance, because that covers dynamic string execution, SP execute SQL, ad hoc statements, how they get cached, what happens with the cache in terms of uh, plan cache bloat, how to deal with it. I, I, that's a really important one. Then I would go into optimizing store procedure performance. And then I would continue on to all the session settings and caching. So I've just given you guys, what, 18 hours of homework. Um, there's a bunch of other blog posts. There's a bunch of plan cache resources. All of these are going to be bundled up in my resources, which I, I'm literally, as soon as I hang up from you guys, I'm going to zip all this stuff up, do a summary, and get all of these resources together. And I'll send these off to Steve. And we should be able to get the recording up in the next you know, day or so. And I will update my blog post for that. So if you guys can't find something, you can tweet, you can email to me, um, you can email to Steve or tweet to see. I mean, somebody will know where these resources are. And you can usually find us on one of these different uh, channels. Um, so anyway, I really want to thank you for today. And I'm going to go back and look at the questions. Um, and I know there's a few things that I didn't hit. I tried to hit as many of them as I could during the session. Um, I've hit, okay. You, you know, Steve, I didn't ask, but is there a way that they can find out about, oh good, fundamentals.pass.org, and they send out the information about webcasts to the members. Perfect. Great. Um, yeah, this is great. Okay, the recording will be ready in the next 24 hours. Um, oh, thank you. Some of you are thanking me for what I do. That's really nice. I, you know, it's so nice that I get such great interaction from you guys. I love being in the SQL community. In fact, I, I talk to so many other people in other tech communities, and they just don't have the involvement and the feedback and the interaction, especially on things like Twitter. So, you know, you're welcome, you guys, and thank you, and thank you for that. Um, and the Slack channel, I'm sure you'll start hearing more about that. That's definitely going to be an interesting avenue that some of you guys can use, uh, the hashtag DBA Fundamentals on the Slack. Um, how can we know or identify the plans are regenerated or not? Um, kind of an interesting one. I'm not sure I fully understand. They've left the discussion. So, um, you know, you can look in the cache. Um, so hopefully they'll come back to the recording. But the only way to, to know is to start spelunking in the cache. And there's definitely a lot of stuff you can do. In fact, I would argue that some of you guys should check out Glenn Berry's session on DMVs because he really gives you a lot of great queries and code. And Steve, you mentioned that's one of the sessions that is one of the first ones you've mm -hmm. ever repeated because it's so valuable. So I totally agree. Check out Glenn Berry's DMV queries and check out his session for sure. That's going to be one of the ways to really get some insight into the cache. And here's another long one. If I have similar databases on a server, they all have the same table structure and same store procedures. If I'm calling procedure A from database A, does that use the same cache that could be existing for the store procedure and database B? This is a great question. And I would obviously, because I won't guarantee that my brain knows everything, especially when people are asking me in this kind of a firing squad, <laughs> but, um, I would say that you're going to get the session settings from the session you're connected in. So if you're connected in a session with database A and you've changed session settings, it almost doesn't matter which databases you're accessing, you're going to use those session settings. So I would say the session settings are more important than even the database that you're in, but there's probably a few things that the database is going to impact as well. So I would say that you have to be careful and, and you may in fact want to make sure that you're using, you know, fully qualified names, that you're connecting to the right databases, or if you're not going to do that, that you're doing some significant testing. Um, I already answered that. 
<laughs> uh, someone asked if I can provide the licensing budget for <laughs> higher versions of SQL. You know, it, I, my joke is always that I wish the SQL team would give me kickbacks for recommending the higher versions, but I do want to promise you I don't get any kickbacks. I, I do not benefit from telling you guys to move to 2016, but the licensing costs are higher, but they're higher as soon as you start hitting 2012. So if you're really going to bite the bullet and upgrade, and I would start recommending that because you are, you are really starting to limit even your support abilities if you're still on 2008 or 2008 R2, all I'm saying is just don't bother considering 2012 or 2014 now. I mean, if you haven't already done all of the testing that's necessary to go to 2012 or 2014, you should be looking to 2016 because your upgrade path is really straightforward. Um, I showed you guys some session settings. Oh, I didn't tell you what session settings were. Um, I showed you in the DM exec sessions, but some of those session setting things like quote and identifier, ANSI nulls, what they do is they change the behavior of some statements and how they execute. And as a result, they can influence your store procedure warranting a different plan. So there's a really good section in the books online called session settings that affect results. Okay, or that affect, it might be affect results. <laughs> um, but anyway, you can find that in the books online. Um, I've already shown you guys how to resolve these issues. Uh, how to find session settings for a plan already in the cache is really complicated. It's actually a cross uh, joined to some other DMVs. So I'd recommend checking out the code from my Pluralsight course part two. And I think I'm almost done with the questions. Let me Okay. Um, is there a way to go back and see the plan that was used when the procedure was run? So let's say a store procedure was run last night. Can you go back and see what plan was used? Um, maybe. This is a tough one. Um, I, I would probably argue for most environments, for most databases, and most versions, no. Uh, in SQL 2016, the query store might help you in finding um, some of the plans and the history of the plans. And I guess since some of you might be joining Pluralsight with the, the code, um, check out Aaron Stilato's brand new course on the query store because that's a very cool thing that can actually help you. And I am getting more questions here. Um, uh, one comment that, that stresses that parameter sniffing is mostly due to skewed data. Um, that's actually not entirely true. I mean, it's even more problematic when your data is skewed. I totally agree with that. But parameter sensitivity is really independent of the skew of the data, and it's tied more to the combination of parameters that might be executed. And the more combinations there are, and the more kind of uh, wild the result set is, the more potentially problematic your plans can be. So that's what I really want to stress. Um, what about after an upgrade? Well, if you upgrade, all of your store procedures will be recompiled. In fact, even if you change compatibility mode of an existing database, you will invalidate your entire database's plan cache. So you will get new plans. And no, there isn't a reason to recompile after an upgrade because it will already be done. Um, Cool. I think I've got okay. Okay. So this is actually a great question. Um, does what I'm saying apply to statements or just stored procedures? And the question is, when are ad hoc statements cached? And I, I'm going to keep this one simple. I've got a whole Pluralsight course on this. That's the statement execution course. But simply put, ad hoc statements are only cached if the statement is incredibly simple. Um, in fact, the only ad hoc statements that get cached and parameterized are statements that have what we call a trivial plan. So I, I would argue that most ad hoc statements aren't cached. Now, if you execute statements through SP execute SQL, then those statements are cached. That's called forced caching. So it's really important to get a good, clear understanding, more than anything, as to how your applications are submitting their requests. So I'll leave that one. Um, okay. Oh, linked servers. Oof, this is a tough one. Um, linked servers definitely add another level of complexity. 
There's actually a really good presentation uh, by Connor Cunningham that was done for SQL Bits. So if you put in Connor Cunningham SQL Bits link servers, you'll find his presentation. And that's a really good one because there's actually a lot of stuff that changes as you start to use link servers. So that one's a, a can of worms I don't have time to get to. Um, and I think, you know, the, the last one is really the solution I showed you, the hybrid solution. What is the best way to write a store procedure with a variety of parameters? You know, very carefully. <laughs> no, I, simply put, the hybrid solution is what can help when you have a variety of parameters. And, and yay, I actually got through the entire set of questions. You guys had a, a tremendous number of great questions. And I know I ran over. I guess my presentation was just about 90 minutes, and the intro was 10 minutes. So we're kind of on time. And I really want to thank you guys for joining for today. I'm going to close out my side of things. I think Steve might have some closing words. And, and just check out our blogs. Check out our Twitter handles. And if you have any questions um, you know, specifically related to the class, you can let me know, Kimberly at sqlskills.com. So thank you very much, and have a great day, everyone. Thanks, Kimberly. I mean, this this was a huge amount of information, and I really suggest that people. Uh, I mean, you you gave tons of different possible possible places to go do some stuff, but I definitely say they need to go and check out Pluralsight because they can take the the detailed long. Uh, classes and, and you really get this stuff good and I love that hybrid solution because uh, we've got a couple of stored procs that give us a lot of heck and that would be a great opportunity for those but yeah it's cool right it's, yeah. it's not it's not that complicated when you really look at it but just most people don't even know to think about it or, or to, to look at their code in a different way well, and it, and it makes sense because there's, I mean, we've got one particular one to where the parameters are definitely different when the East Coast people start signing on in the mornings. And that's the one that gives us problems. So I think this is a great opportunity for that. I've, the, I've looked at the developers, and I think they're already thinking about doing something with that. Okay. I uh, really appreciate it, and I, we love SQL skills, and, and it's amazing that you were able to get through those questions because they were, they started really piling and <laughs> And, and we're really coming in like a garden hose there towards the end. So anyway. Yeah, no, it's great. And there's a lot of people thanking us for this session. So, you know, Steve, thank you for putting all this together and doing all the work to to, to herd the cats, <laughs> <laughs> as it's proverbially called, right, and, and get us all on to this and, and to present. It's really, it's great that you guys do this. And it's, it's fun to do. I really enjoy the community, especially when it's, you know, like this and you guys saying thanks. So you're welcome, everyone. And thank you. And I've got one thing to add in. I missed Raleigh in Chicago uh, having SQL Saturdays on March the 11th. I told somebody I would squeeze that in. Thank oh, you. Thank you. And uh, and uh, I think you probably have got over 500 and probably the most. So I'll, I'll let you know, but I think you are over it, though. You did great. fantastic. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Thanks. Bye.